Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. Well, we're still in Texas, and we're still doing our Sunday school lesson via the internet. So we look forward to this morning's session, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy bringing it to you. Good morning. Good morning. So good morning again, and today we're going to, our lesson's titled Shipwrecked. Shipwrecked. Shipwreck. Yep. This is a shipwreck that is described in Acts 27. And we're going to pick and choose some of the verses we're reading from selections between verses 1 and 44. We won't read all of it because it gets long, but we're going to read the parts that highlight our lesson. So if you think about to last week's lesson, Mr. Rudy, Paul continued to travel on his missionary journeys. And in the last lesson, we learned three important lessons. Do you what remember they? what they were? Yeah, I think I do. What was one of them? What was one of them? The importance of the Holy Spirit. The one. importance of the Holy Spirit. The God, the God we worship is a God of three parts, and the Holy Spirit is one of those three parts. The, one of the other things we learned about how one has to be courageous sometimes in ministry. Oh, absolutely. I think we're going to hear about some courage today. You think so? I do. I do. Okay. And then the last one is the importance of trusting in God in everything that we do. And that was true then, and that's true today. Absolutely true today. So we're going to find Paul still traveling, but this time he's charged falsely. Somebody makes an accusation about him. They, they say he did something that he didn't do. And he's taken prisoner, and he's sent to Caesarea to be tried before King Agrippa. The king couldn't find any fault in Paul. He, he couldn't find anything to call him guilty. And Paul, because he was a Roman, he requested to be tried by Caesar. So Paul and some other prisoners were put on a ship that would sail to Rome, where the Roman emperor was. The weather was getting very bad. It was winter time. And Paul urged the soldiers to stay where they were in a city called Fair Havens and wait for the winter, winter weather to pass. So we're going to see how all this turns out. Well, wait a minute. Why did uh, King Agrippa send Paul to Rome? Well, I mean, that's a long way away. It's a long way away. And... Um, they're transporting prisoners that, that, costs, that costs some money to do. Um, but the reason that they did that is because Paul was a Roman citizen. And as a Roman citizen, he has certain rights that were respected by other countries. And one of those rights was that when he was accused, he could be tried by the emperor of, of his nation, of, by, by Caesar. And so um, he wanted... His, his emperor to hear his case. So before we get into this all too much further, Mr. Rudy, would you please pray for us? Absolutely. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the many blessings that you bestow on each and every one of us. I know there's difficult times out there. and Summer is not like our normal summer and there's lots of restrictions and uh, there's lots of cons health concerns. But Lord, we know that you are ultimately in charge and that we can have total faith and trust in you. Just as Paul does in today's lesson, we know that we can trust you in that. While we may go through difficult times, you will be there with us and you will lead us, guide us, and protect us. So we ask that you be with us. We ask that you bless today's lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are going to start in uh, chapter 27. We're going to start in verses 7 and 8. And it says, When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Sendus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of the Crete of Crete of Solomon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia. So remind me, where was it that 
Where, where did Paul want to stay? Paul wanted to stay in Fairhaven because he knew we were in for bad weather. Winter time was very difficult for sailing ships because uh, the crews didn't have a lot of control over the ships. The wind kind of directed where they would do and how their ships would act in the weather. So ships are really big, but you say they've only got sails. They only have sails, and the sails only went one way. So whatever direction the wind was blowing, that's the direction the ship went. Wow. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to read on verses 9 and 11. Now, when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, then I perceive that this voyage will end up with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Wow. Paul's, Paul's telling them that he really thinks this is a bad idea. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And it was. <clears throat> Who persuaded the centurion to leave Fairhaven? The owner of the ship. He, uh, his, his title was helmsman. Um, and he persuaded the centurion, which is another word kind of for captain, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. guy in charge yeah. of, the, of the ship there. Um, he was the owner of the ship, and he'd been, he'd been given the warnings, and he said, let's go. So they left. So they left. So we see in, we're going to jump down to verses 21 through 24, and we read, But after a long absence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete and incurred the disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. So what was the angel saying? What was he telling Paul? The angel was telling Paul that why the uh, trip may be difficult and fraught with a lot of uh, uh, danger, that ultimately the ship would be lost and all the supplies of the ship would be lost. But not one person of the 276 people aboard the ship would die. And Paul had great faith in what the angel told him. And I, I think this, is, well, I know, this is also another great example of God trusting, and Paul trusting in God. Yeah, you have to try it. I mean, you know, here you are, you're in a storm, and you hear God's voice, and it tells you it's going to be okay. And uh, that's the way it is for us. God tells us many times it's going to be okay. We're in the eye of the storm. Okay, reading on verses 27 through 29. Now when the 14th night had come and we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms and when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rock, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. Mr. Rudy, I don't know if you've ever heard me call him the boatman, but he's the boatman because <laughs> we live on a boat. What what does this mean? What are what are sound, <coughs> soundings? What are what are fathoms and? Well, when you take a sounding uh, in today's 
time you have a metal tape and on the end of it you have a brass plumb bob and you drop that down tubes aboard the ship and you can tell how deep the water is by where it hits on the bottom of the uh, seafloor bed. It'll tell you how deep it is. In biblical days, they used a rope and a rock, and they put knots in at every fathom. And the fathom is six feet. So every six feet, the rope had a knot in it. So they could throw that overboard, count the number of knots, and they knew how deep the water was. So in current times, we're advised to protect ourselves from the COVID virus by being a fathom away from each other. That is true. That's a good one. All right. Now, how many nights were they in the storm? They were out on that ship, tossing around on the sea for 14 nights. That's two weeks. It is two weeks. And there's constant stress. The freight is shifting. They're probably getting, like, they need a shower. Probably some of them are getting seasick. They're probably, some of them are getting seasick. Their food is probably getting to the bottom of the fresh stuff and um, maybe even going a little bit thin. There were 276 people on that ship, and most of them were were, um, prisoners. Yeah. Some of them were really probably criminals. And generally, prisoners weren't treated very well. They weren't treated very well. So imagine that. Now, imagine that. Do you you think that that Paul prayed? I think Paul did a lot of praying. Yeah. But more importantly, he had a lot of faith in what God had told him. And he put his trust in that. Yeah, he did. He did. Now we see in Acts 30 through 35, and as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, meaning the stern of the ship, uh, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So what Paul was saying was, is anybody tries to escape, then everybody is going to lose their life. And as, and as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day. You have waited and continued without food and eat, eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment. For this is for your survival. Since not a hair will fall from your head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, gave thanks to God. Remember that. He gave thanks to God in the middle of the storm. In the presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. So... Everybody on the ship, what do you think they were thinking was going to happen? They had pretty much figured out the ship was going to get wrecked. It was going to be wrecked, huh? Yeah. And that had to be scary in itself. But we see in these verses, Paul, again, trusting and in, the, in the Lord and witnessing to the other people. Well, yeah, Paul is ministering. He is sharing his faith Just in the simple act of breaking bread and praying, he shares his faith with what we can assume were a lot of non-believers. We don't know that for a fact, but uh, it's a pretty good guess that most of them were not Christians. So would you call this a a ministry? Oh, this was as much as a missionary trip as any that he took. This was a segment of his overall trip, but God had a plan. And God was fulfilling that plan through Paul, through all these events. And sometimes we get into difficult situations, and it's not comfortable for us. But Mm -hmm. sometimes God doesn't want us to be comfortable. And and so we see that the part of this ministry, um, as he was trusting and relying on the, the Lord, 
and witnessing to others, he was also encouraging them, reminding them to do something as basic as to eat. Yeah. Go ahead and eat so that they would survive. Well, going on, starting at 39, when it was day, but they did not recognize the light. When, the, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left, left them in the sea, meanwhile loosening the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for the shore. But, a, but striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. That sounds dangerous. That sounds scary. Just reading it, I'm scared. Could you explain again a little bit more about what was happening in the ship for us? Well, again, remember, the wind really controlled the direction of the ship. They did not want to go on rocks, a rocky shore, and break up, but they saw a beach, which I am sure God had planned it this way, and they headed for the beach, and they put the bow of the ship on the beach. So they pushed it into the sand, and it stuck there. Now, we don't know how big the ship was. We do know it had 276 people, so it was a pretty good-sized wooden ship. But there was a big storm, and the storm was pounding on the back end of the boat, or what we call the stern of the boat. And since it was wood, it was being broken up. And the people aboard uh, tried to escape. Some of them, they could swim, jumped overboard, swam to land. Others who could not swim were taking pieces of the broken up ship, jumping on those and floating to the beach. But the important thing is, remember, God said that no one would die of the 276 persons aboard the ship. And no one did. They all ended up on the beach. Now, reading in uh, 27, we're reading, starting with verse 42. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, or the captain, wanting to save Paul, kept, him, kept them from the purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land and the rest some on board some on parts of the ship and so it was that they all escaped safely to land they all survived they all survived so what were the soldiers after all these people survived what were they planning well the, their initial plan was they were going to kill all the prisoners because in biblical days if you were in charge of prisoners and they escaped, you paid for it with your life. And so the soldiers obviously weren't trusting in God or they wouldn't have come up with this plan. But the unusual thing is the centurion wanted Paul to have his day with Caesar. So God was working on this man's heart. We don't know how far it went, but we know he was working on this man's heart because the centurion put a stop to it. So no prisoners were killed. Everybody got off the ship safely. And God's plan that Paul should make it to Rome to be brought before Caesar. Is still in the makings, but I bet you he gets there. And do you think he'll continue to witness to people when he gets there? Oh, I think he does. I think he does too. So today, again, we learned some very important lessons. And Rudy and I have talked about how these lessons apply to Paul's life and to the people in his life and, and how they also apply to our lives directly. And, and that's what God's Word does. Through, through the centuries, God's Word has provided guidance and comfort to believers 
and that is true today, on this day, all, all week long, every day, as it always has. But so, before I go on some more with that amazing thing, today what we learned are the three things. God can lead us out of what is comfortable. Sometimes, as Rudy just said, we may be in God's will and also uncomfortable. Probably many times. Many but that's times. how we grow as a Christian. It is. And just as Paul had comfort, he had faith in these terrible storms, we can find comfort in the promise of the storm that God, in, in God's promise, that he will see us through the storm. And then the third thing we learned today, that being safe doesn't mean we're out of danger. We can be uncomfortable and in God's protection. We can feel comfortable and safe. We're still in God's protection, but that doesn't mean that we are safe. There are unseen dangers. There are dangers to us that are unknown to us. We don't know what the future holds for us, but what we do know absolutely every day that we can trust in God to see us through. Amen. 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 So, would you close us in prayer? I certainly will. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time we've had to spend with our young people. Uh, we just pray for your guidance, direction. We hope that we would take today's lesson, apply it to our lives, and always remember that we can trust in you even though when times are uncomfortable or difficult, you're there with us and you will support us and you will see us through it. So we ask that you put your arms around every young person of our church and their family lift, and we lift them up to you, Father, and we pray for their safekeeping. But more than anything else, we pray for your work in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you next week.